Thank you. Uh, first off, I just wanted to thank the Neiman Foundation. It's so good to be back. And I have um, just flown in from Jakarta. So if I seem a little out of it, that's why. More out of it than, than usual. Um, I, I wanted to, um, since there's a lot of journalists in the room, we have been getting a lot of questions from journalists about how we did this, as she mentioned, a very complicated um, story. And so I, I, I thought I would walk you through some of the slides that we put together to kind of explain it. Um, so when we first started this story, um, it was an open secret. Um, you know, many of us had known that there were problems in Southeast Asia's seafood industry and the labor abuses that were extreme for a long time. And journalists had written stories um, about individual men who had been enslaved and had either been rescued or somehow managed to escape or they had done investigations mainly in Thailand looking at um, problems in Thai waters. But no one had really looked um, much beyond Thailand in foreign waters thousands of miles away. And um, a source of mine suggested that I take a look um, after he showed me some data that they had been finding quite a few um, men, mostly from Myanmar, who were stranded or who had been abandoned in Indonesia. And so um, I started this with Robin McDowell, and it took us about a year until we finally um, got a really good lead. And we went from the, the capital in Jakarta here to uh, this area, which um, is in the Arafura Sea, known as Benjina. And you can see it's, it's in a really remote area. This, these are massive fishing grounds, and it's very close to Australia down here and, and Papua here. Um, that's upside down. But basically, you can see this was all that was here. This is the fishing compound, and this is private property. And you can see where the cloud cover is. Those are the boats. And then over here is where the little village was. So they had to go across the, the channel. Um, Robin McDowell went, and she found um, almost immediately a lot of men, um, mainly from Myanmar, where she was a correspondent at the time. And uh, you know these men were working on the boats, but she couldn't communicate with them because she doesn't speak Burmese. So she called in um, Esther Tucson, our Myanmar uh, reporter from, from uh, Yangon. And um, again, they saw men working everywhere, you know, and they soon found out that none of these men were being paid. They heard stories of abuse. They were being whipped by stingray tails. Um, you know, some men were thrown overboard. Some men died, and they would put them in the freezers of the ships and bring them back. Um, this man, he somehow managed to get a hold of his documents because they would confiscate all the documents. But he got this document, and it was his picture, but the name was a Thai man's name, a Thai man's birth date and address. None of this was him. Um, Robin then went to this graveyard, and there were almost 70 crude markers like this. And she talked to this man, and he said that where he stood, he buried a friend who was Burmese. But again, this marker is for a Thai man, so even in death. Um, they were not given the dignity of having their own names. And at that point, we, um, she was communicating with me, and we were outraged. And we knew when we found this guy that we had one heck of a story. So this guy um, and some other men were in a cage. And they were on the co government or the, the, um, the company property in this cage. Um, and we weren't able to actually interview him, so we, we got another worker to take a, a camera and had him ask a couple questions for us, which was very dangerous. And he said the only thing he was locked up for was asking to go home. He'd hurt his back, and he didn't want to work anymore. He wasn't being paid. Neither of the, none of the men were being paid. Um, and then he was, he was put in this, in this uh, cage. So at that point, we knew that in order to make people care about the story, and our goal from the beginning was to do two things. We wanted to try to find captive men, and we also wanted to trace their fish back to American restaurants and dinner tables. And so we watched their fish being loaded onto this refrigerated cargo ship. And um, at that point, we then used satellites to track it. As it went back, took two weeks to get back to Thailand. 
to the port town of Samutsukon, which is about an hour outside of Bangkok. And then we flew, Robin from uh, Myanmar and, and myself from Jakarta, we flew there and we watched in, in trucks, um, in, the, in the back cabs of trucks behind tented windows, we watched these loads being put into trucks and being delivered all over the city. And we followed for four nights, four very long nights, <laughs> we followed these trucks as they fanned out and we were eating McDonald's and singing and doing, it was not at all a professional stakeout that you probably think. Um, it, was, it was really crazy. We, sometimes we lost the trucks and had to go back and find new trucks and um, fortunately there was a large supply of trucks going out um, all over the place. And then we brought in Martha Mendoza in the US and she started connecting the dots from the Thai companies that we saw these trucks going to. She used US Customs Records to connect the dots to all kind of very familiar names back here in the US. Um, and so at that point, we'd accomplished our two goals, but we still had a problem. We'd interviewed these men on this island, the slave island, and they were um, essentially, obviously captive and in a lot of danger. And so if we ran our story um, and published with their names and their faces, they could be hurt or killed. And we knew this. And so we took kind of an extraordinary step. The reporters and the editor, our editor, we all said, look, we, we don't want to use this unless we can, these men are safe. And we took this to the AP, and it went to the highest levels of the company. And everyone agreed, we can't run the story until these men are safe. So um, I went to a source of mine at the IOM, and I asked for help. And he went to the Indonesian Marine Police, and we gave them pictures of all of our guys who were going to be in our story. And they went to the island, and they got the guys off and took them to safety, and then we published. And about a week and a half later, the Indonesian government sent a task force to the island and basically confirmed what we had reported and said that they could not leave these men there anymore. They weren't safe. And so they spontaneously... Um, started the first rescue from the island. And when word started to spread, um, the men literally started to run. And they, many of them had been in hiding. And they ran from the jungles and from the hills. And some of them went back and leaped into their trawlers and grabbed whatever meager belongings they had. So t-shirts or whatever they owned, they stuffed them into plastic bags. And it started to rain and they just ran. And you can see here, they were elated um, and overjoyed that they were finally going to be free. And here, this picture, we ask, who wants to go home? The fishing ministry asked. And they all raised their hands. Um, and uh, back in the US, the story was also getting traction. There were congressional hearings. And some congressmen were concerned because there was a law in our books, an 85-year-old law that basically said that materials produced by slave labor could enter the country if there was consumptive demand. Yeah, and so um, they worked to fix that. And a few weeks ago, um, Obama um, signed the new law, which does not have that, and now there have been at least, I think, two shipments um, that have been stopped. Um, in, the, in the meantime, the men had, were taken from Benjina to another island nearby called Tool, where they were put in a makeshift camp. And this was the first time, really, that they could speak freely. And so um, I went there and distributed questionnaires in three different languages to try to get as many details as I could, and we built a database from that. And I also was looking for, um, I was looking for a story to tell. And I wanted it to be um, a story that could embody basically all of the struggles that these men had been, had been through. And I wanted to follow that man home. And you can see we, here they are getting photographed, and we built an interactive of all the different guys. Um, but I found my, my one guy, and, and when, they, when he started to go home, and here they are going home, I followed him back to Myanmar. And he had been in Indonesia, trafficked 
22 years prior. And he had um, been beaten severely a couple of times. He'd been chained to the deck of the boat and left to die um, and has managed to escape. His story was extremely dramatic. He was partially paralyzed on one side of his body and had been living, eking out a meager existence in the jungle, basically farming vegetables for many years. And so I followed that man home, and I have the video to show, and I'll end with, this was happening all over Southeast Asia, and um, you know we have said from the beginning that you know this project has been extraordinary, but for us, this, um, this moment and seeing this and knowing that this has happened everywhere because of our reporting, because of the impact, it, th there's nothing that can top, can top this. Coming, freed slave Mian Nai has been waiting for all his adult life. Tricked into becoming a slave on a fishing boat as a teenager, he hasn't seen his family in Myanmar for 22 years. Until now. That's his sister, who was just 10 when they last saw each other. Moments later, he sees his mother. The emotions are overwhelming. For his mother, it is too much. She collapses and has to be revived. I'm so very, very happy that I'm able to see my mother and my own siblings again. Unendingly happy. I had a broken heart. My son, do you have a shirt and a blanket? Do you have a warm place to stay? Are other people torturing you? I had those thoughts entering my head. In fact, people have been torturing Mien for years. His story is similar to that of hundreds of other slaves, revealed in a year-long investigation by the Associated Press into how the multi-billion dollar fishing industry operates in Southeast Asia. An industry that relies on slaves, working in dangerous conditions like these, to supply fish to major supermarkets and stores worldwide including the United States. When he left home, Mian never thought he would end up a slave. In 1993, an agent promised him a job in Thailand where he'd make enough money in a few months to help his family for a year. But soon after crossing the border to Thailand, he was shipped to a far corner of Indonesia in the Arafura Sea, one of the world's richest fishing grounds. He was told he would never go home. In that place, if I consider it, we don't even have the same value as a cow. We get cold, we get a fever. They don't feed us or give us water regularly. Often he worked 24 hours a day with only boiled seawater to drink. He was whipped many times. At one point, he begged his Thai captain for freedom. I just knelt down and hugged his legs and begged him to let me go home. I said I didn't want any money. I just wanted to go back home. But the captain left him to die, chained to the deck of the ship for days. He managed to escape the slave fishing boats twice, hiding for years in a jungle, growing vegetables to eat. When we lived in Indonesia, there was no way to come back. Would I live or die? I can't say. I thought I'd be able to come back only when God saves me. But Min Nai was saved. Since the AP report in April, more than 800 former slaves have been freed. Mien now reflects on his future while praying at his family's Buddhist altar. In the future, I'll never go anywhere again. I'll work for my living in Myanmar only. I'll die in Myanmar. A future that includes posing for family photographs he never thought would happen again. David Bruns, The Associated Press.